from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am Carolyn Brown. I direct the Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center here at the library. And it gives me great pleasure, um, that's not an exaggeration, uh, to welcome you here this afternoon for a lecture by David Grinspoon, who is the inaugural Baruch S. Blumberg NASA LC Chair in Astrobiology. It's a long title, but there's a good reason for it. Um, which you'll hear about. The lecture today is uh, titled, Terra Sapiens, the Human Chapter in the History of Life. And if that term, Terra Sapiens, is not familiar to you, that's because you're hearing it here first. Uh, before we begin, please, if you would um, turn off your cell phones or at least get them mute so that they don't um, go off and interfere with the program and anything else that might bong or bang or something. Today's program is a product of the collaboration um, between NASA and the Library of Congress to explore the humanistic and societal uh, implications of the field of astrobiology. Um, science can ask questions about what exists, how it came into being, and the physical processes that are likely to unfold. But there are questions that science can't ask um, questions about uh, the meaning of our lives, uh, some understanding of who we really are as human beings, um, and questions about what we do with what we learn from the scientific process. And the two sets of questions are complementary, and this uh, chair and the chair's program bring together those two elements, the scientific and the humanistic, you might say. Um, the vision for this collaboration came from Dr. Baruch S. Blumberg, who is a Nobel Prize winner, but what's most important for us in this context is he was a founding member of the Library Scholars Council, which provides advice to the Kluge Center and the librarian, um, but also uh, the head of the NASA Astrobiology Institute. So he combined these two dimensions in his own purpose. and. It was Barry who came into my office shortly after I assumed this position and said, how about, you know, chair in astrobiology teaming up with NASA to see if I would have an interest? Um, and I said, sure, why not? And this uh, uh, lecture t today and the chair is the fruition of his imagination and hence the name. I'll say a few words about the Kluge Center. Uh, was established through a generous donation of John W. Kluge to create a scholarly venue on Capitol Hill where the finest mature scholars and thinkers might have informal opportunities to talk with members of Congress and other policy makers. In other words, to sort of bring together the world of affairs and the world of ideas um, in a way that there could be useful conversation. The center also supports the rising generation of younger scholars, some of whom I see over here. Um, and we hope that in, oh, 20 or 30 years, some of them will be back as our senior scholars. And we also support a number of lectures such as this one. And you can sign up for additional information if you would like in the back and pick up a brochure. Um, I want to make a special note that um, the uh, LC NASA uh, chair is uh, chair in astrobiology um, is selected through a competition, um, and this competition for the third chair is now open. The, the uh, due date is December 1st. Um, so those of you who might imagine yourself in this role, you might think about you still have time to apply. And I would like to acknowledge our incoming chair, Stephen Dick, who will be our second chair, um, and Mary Wojtek. I just saw her. Where is Mary? Oh, there she is, hiding in the back, um, who is... Um, our wonderful uh, inspiration at NASA and makes, actually makes things happen so that the money comes and the program gets done and the, everything on that side happens. Um, today's speaker, uh, David Grinspoon, as I said, is the first chair in astrobiology. 
David came to us from the Department of Space Sciences at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, where he was curator in astrobiology. His research focus is in the comparative climate evolution of planets um, and the implications that might have for the existence of life in the universe and actually on Earth as well. His book, Lonely Planets, The Natural Philosophy of Alien Life, won the 2004 Penn Center's Literary Award for Research, Nonfiction. Um, Dr. Grinspoon has also awarded the 2006 Carl Sagan Medal for Public Communication of Planetary Science, and that one given by the American Astronomical Society. Um, during his 12 months at the Kluge Center, he's been an extremely active scholar and public intellectual. Um, this is his third public appearance at the library. He also established a number of um, workshops with local area colleagues um, and has been out and about in town. I hope he'll give us a full list before he leaves so we know what he's actually been up to, but you see posters here and there showing up. Um, I know he's continuing to do some of these uh, high profile uh, activities, but he's also these days writing like a maniac um, to finish the book that he's working on. So today officially ends his tenure as chairholder, but he'll be staying on a little bit to work on this book. Um, so it is with great pleasure that I ask you to welcome our whirlwind scholar and first chair in astrobiology, David Grinspoon. Thank you, Carolyn, and uh, thank you all for coming out this afternoon. On Halloween, no less, to hear what I have to say. I'll try to um, keep this brief so we can all go trick or treat. Um, it's, it's bittersweet being here today and realizing that, uh, that a year has somehow gone by since I showed up. It's, it's been an incredible experience being here at the, the Kluge Center and at the Library of Congress. Uh, the, uh, as you can see, it's kind of a nice building, but the, the grandeur of the surroundings are, are matched by the quality of the collections and the, the quality and skill um, and um, collegiality of the, of the people that work here. Um, Carolyn uh, runs an amazing organization here, the Kluge Center, which is sort of the scholarly wing of the Library of Congress hosts uh, an amazing array of scholars working on really interesting projects. And uh, I, I think I was the only scientist here, um, but that didn't mean that I didn't have anyone to talk to. I've, I've been schooled in many topics since I've been here and found surprising synergisms between my work and the work of, uh, of the others here. And it's, it's just been a great experience. And the, and, and the library staff, the, um, the librarians and the, uh, the research specialists have been so helpful in, uh, in helping me to navigate through the collections and find the materials that have helped me to do my work. So I'm, I'm tremendously grateful for, um, for the privilege, the experience. So uh, Terra Sapiens. As Carolyn said, that's a, a new term. It's a, a term I've sort of in, invented, and, and I'm, um, at least, uh, it's, it's at least the working title of the book I'm working on, which will hopefully have a subtitle that, you know, if that's the title, it has to have a subtitle that tells you what the heck it means if you're, <laughs> if you're browsing. But um, it, it, literally, it means, it means wise earth. And it's um, my notion of a vision that we ought to carry into the future as we think deeply about the human role in Earth evolution and what's happening on the Earth now as a result of, of our presence, the presence of our civilization here. Uh, and the work I've been doing here is trying to understand that development, the, the sort of human development on Earth from the perspective of astrobiology. Astrobiology is the the scientific study of life in the universe. That includes life on Earth, but geared towards trying to understand the universals of life. So what lessons does the history and the nature of life on Earth carry for us about the essentials of life, and how do we combine that with our growing knowledge of the rest of the universe, the planets in our solar system and all the planets we we're discovering far beyond? How do we combine all that knowledge to uh, become wiser about the prospects for life in the universe, know how to look for it, know how we would recognize it, and 
contextualize our own existence in the light of all that new knowledge and that new perspective. Well, if you were watching Earth from an alien perspective, say you were a very patient alien who had been watching Earth for billions of years, you would have noticed various changes on the planet over all these eons, but you would have especially noticed that something really strange and really dramatic and new had happened very recently, what's happening right now. For example, if you were looking at the dark side, the night side of Earth over all those eons, it would have been pretty dark through most of that time. Maybe there'd be the occasional lightning flash, the occasional splash of aurora. And then more recently, a few hundred million years ago, when the continents became forested, maybe there'd be the occasional forest fire at night, but still pretty, pretty much unbroken darkness on the night side. Until very recently, you'd see something look like this, springing into being, the lights flickering on, first in the coastal areas and then spreading in networks throughout um, various parts of the night side of Earth. And this would be in conjunction with other dramatic changes. You'd see the composition of our atmosphere changing in new ways. And then very recently, if you were watching carefully, you would have seen these strange little bits of metal start flying off the Earth only in the last 50 years, and some of them even flying to the other planets and sending radio signals back. So something new and very different is happening on our planet. Now, I come to this topic from a career in planetary science and astrobiology, and if I had another half an hour, I would go into more detail about how that perspective informs this study, but I don't have that time, unfortunately, so I'll tell you a couple of the punchlines of that. What I do for my work, as Carolyn mentioned, is I compare, I do comparative planetology. I study the evolution of Earth and Earth-like planets and trying to understand through their similarities and differences what it is that makes planets tick and what it is that makes Earth work and in some ways similar to other planets and in some ways its own, its own little ball of, of uh, water and rock and life. So one thing we can say, one thing we've learned is that Earth-like planets seem to start out fairly similarly. Earth and Venus and Mars, our two nearest neighbors and two most, most Earth-like planets in our solar system, seem to have all started with pretty similar conditions. Not identical, but much more alike than they are now. They all were watery and wet and warm, apparently, when they were young, which is very interesting from the standpoint of astrobiology because it may be that Venus and Mars had conditions that we believe are the conditions that Earth had that were essential to the origin of life. So that's pretty exciting, and we're on the trail of trying to understand if origin of life could have actually happened in these other places. But once the origin of life happened on Earth and apparently didn't happen, or if it did, didn't stick as a phenomenon on our neighboring planets, then there was sort of a divergence. And life has become a dominating force in the evolution of Earth, not just the life itself, this thin film on the surface of the planet, but the physical nature of Earth in many, many ways has been dramatically changed by the presence of life. So there was sort of a branching point, perhaps about three billion, sometime between three and four, we're still trying to pinpoint the time of the origin of life, but there was a branching point, and since that time, over something like three billion years plus, the Earth has been evolving under the, under the influence of forces that have not been greatly at work on our neighboring planets. So one thing we've learned is that Earth is an odd ball. It's, in our solar system, really unusual. Um, in fact, it may be said, it was said here by m my colleague Colin Goldblatt, that the defining characteristic of Earth is planetary scale life. Now, that was a divergence that happened a long time ago. But very recently, you might argue, another branching point has been reached. Much more recently, Earth has been under the influence of a new type of geological force, the global activities of humanity, defining what we refer to as the Anthropocene era, of course, meaning anthropo, human, the time of humanity. This is 
a fruitful concept. It's a controversial concept for some reasons I'll get into, but it sparked a lot of really interesting conversations. This notion that humans have become a dominant force of planetary change on the Earth. In a sense, what this means is the joining of several different historical timescales that we've traditionally thought of sort of separately in this, and they're represented here on this, this graph. The geological timescale, all these ages, the Triassic, the Jurassic, which is famous because it's a Hollywood star, the Cretaceous, the Paleocene, and so forth. Uh, that's one way of thinking about time. On the right here, the history of life, the succession of stages in the evolution of life, biological time. And then in the center here, what we think of as history, human history, the, uh, the events and people and civilizations that mark what we, what we call history in, um, as an academic discipline. But in a certain sense with the, the Anthropocene, we're realizing that these have all become conjoined, that human history has now become a factor in the geological history of Earth and the biological history of Earth. And it's an interesting question whether they've become sort of irreversibly conjoined. That, of course, depends on, on the future. Now, the Anthropocene has become a hot topic in Earth science. This is just one of many papers I could show you, but there are special issues of journals and publications, and actually now at least two professional journals, maybe three, that are just devoted to the Anthropocene. And if you go to our meetings, like the American Geophysical Union, our big Earth science meetings, there are now sessions on the Anthropocene. So it's become something that's in the air and is being talked about by scientists and is proposed as an official new term for the geological time that we're in now. It's not, it has not been ratified, been made official, but it's, it's uh, the, uh, the proposal is, is out there under consideration. And just very quickly, and you know, again, one could give a whole talk on just this subject, the evidence, but uh, th these are some graphs showing the change over time of various factors that represent human influence on the Earth. And uh, so, for example, in the upper left, population is an obvious one. Water use, damming of river, rivers, down near the lower right, there's some you know, more sort of funny ones like McDonald's restaurants uh, and so forth. But the point is there's a similarity to the shape of all these, and that's not coincidental, this represents the accelerating influence of humans on the Earth. And you'll notice there's an inflection point, a change in slope, right around 1950 in all of these, and that's the time that scholars of the Anthropocene call the Great Acceleration, where uh, for, um, for people can debate the reasons, but there was, there was uh, uh, and probably the reason had to do that all this was latent, and then during the, the wars, People were busy with other things, and once the, the uh, wars were over, um, the uh, economy and industry sort of pent up, let loose, uh, spurred on by the technological innovations that, whether we like it or not, are often the product of war. But at, at any rate, this great acceleration um, led to a massive increase in human influence in all these different ways. And then this next set of graphs shows you sort of these all represent the response of different aspects of the Earth system to those provocations by human civilization, so-called civilization. Uh, for instance, upper left, obviously CO2 is one we hear a lot about. There, on the top here, there are other atmospheric gases that are doing something similarly. And then as you go down, uh, various other things having to do with the hydrological cycle and um, the numbers of floods over time, biodiversity, species loss. I, I won't go through all this, but I, you know, the, the evidence is there. If anybody needs convincing, I can point you towards the papers. But, but again, you see there's a, there's a similarity in, in shape to these, the, the time history of a lot of these factors, and that is not just coincidence. Uh, we, humans have become a dominant force on Earth. Now, one response to this by some scientists who are skeptical perhaps of the significance of the Anthropocene is to say, well, so what? We're not the first species to come along and radically change the Earth. What's so special about us? And that's true, actually. If you look through the long history of 
of Earth. There's some dramatic episodes of other species coming, coming along and evolving and radically changing the planet to the point where the Earth became horribly polluted and led to mass extinctions due to the result of species that were here long before we came along. For example, this chart shows you um, the uh, rise of oxygen over time and you'll notice that where it jumps up just before two billion years ago, this is uh, known as the, the great oxygen, oxygen, oxygenization event. That's hard to say, especially when you're on stage. Oxygenization. Say it five times fast. Anyways, um, the great oxygenization event um, is often thought of, or, or, or I think argu arguably is, the most extreme chemical transition in the history of Earth. When life discovered photosynthesis and started breaking up molecules for energy using sunlight, releasing oxygen, making organic stuff to, uh, to live on. It was a wonderful innovation for, uh, to spur evolution and to spur the amount of biomass on Earth. It was also a horrible ecological disaster. All that oxygen, oxygen is poison for organic life. And we don't think of it that way because our ancestors evolved to use it and we breathe and we, that, that oxygen creates a big chemical imbalance. And if you've evolved the right enzymes, then you live off that imbalance and you're like, great, oxygen, I can breathe. But if you don't have those enzymes and your organic life on a planet, you die. So it led to a lot of mass death. Um, so this is interesting thinking about the role of humans. What's different about us? We're not the first species to come along and even we're not the first species to come along seeking a new energy source. That's all these poor innocent cyanobacteria were doing was trying to find a better source of energy. And they did, photosynthesis, and they destroyed the earth practically. In fact, it's amazing how close they came to destroying the earth because not only did they poison the atmosphere with oxygen, but they, uh, it, this probably caused a massive climate crisis. There's something, an episode that scientists call snowball earth, where the earth became fully, almost fully glaciated, frozen over, and it could have come close to being irreversibly glaciated, where you get in this sort of stuck in this cul-de-sac where if the earth is covered with ice, it reflects more sunlight, which keeps the earth cold and it can't, it can't unfreeze itself. And some scientists think that we actually maybe came close to destroying the biosphere permanently. So those cyanobacteria, uh, in one way of thinking about it, were not entirely innocent, but in another way of thinking about it, they were entirely innocent because they were just doing what life does, which is multiply and find new ways to survive. So isn't that what we're doing? How are we different from the cyanobacteria? In what sense can we be said to have responsibility or, or be some, something really new on this planet? Well, in an effort to try to answer that question, I've come up with a, a sort of taxonomy of catastrophe. I've looked at all the different kinds of changes that can happen on planets. And there are a lot of changes that happen over the life history of a planet like Earth and other planets. And I've tried to abstract that into four major kinds of global change on planets. Classified with respect to biotic influence. In other words, with respect to the role of life. And so, so, so here's, my, here's my list of four kinds, the, main, the four main kinds of global change. The first one I'll call natural disasters. And that's just uh, when, as the bumper st sticker says, stuff happens, right? Uh, good things, or bad things happen to good planets. An asteroid comes along and causes a mass extinction, as famously happened 65 million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs and 90% of other species alive at that time. Or there'll be a massive episode of volcanic activity because of some super plume, volcanic super plume in the mantle, and that's happened before too, leading to a massive climate change and a lot of die-offs. Or even in this category, you could say there are things that sometimes happen out there in the galaxy, gamma ray bursts or supernova, that if they're close enough can sterilize the life on a planet. So this is all by way of saying that we do live in a dangerous universe on a sometimes dangerous planet and stuff happens that sometimes life has nothing to do with. So that's what I'm calling natural disasters. Natural in this sense, natural is a loaded word, I'll come back to that, but in this sense meaning um, that life had nothing to do with it, innocent bystander. Okay, the next category of change, which I'm calling biologically induced catastrophes, I'm symbolizing here with 
the green leaf. And because probably the best example of that is the one that I already mentioned, the evolution of photosynthesis, which was, you know, must have seemed like a great idea at the time, except of course, as far as we know, there wasn't anybody there that had ideas in that sense. But it was certainly a productive innovation for life. And, um, but the local effects were wonderful for those organisms. The global effects over time were disastrous as the oxygen built up. So uh, that's what I'm calling a biologically induced catastrophe. And th these natural disasters, as I mentioned, category one of global change will happen everywhere, every planet. In fact, the good planets, the planets with life, I argue will have, I argue will have more of them because a planet like Earth that has the kind of vigorous activity that facilitates habitability with the kinds of chemical flows we have and so forth is active and therefore more likely to have these sort of natural disasters, at least the internally generated ones. Category two, the biologically induced disasters, catastrophes, I argue will happen on any planet with life. That life sooner or later, because what does life do? It finds new survival techniques and it multiplies, it maximizes its, um, its biomass, it maximizes its ability to multiply and occupy whatever territory it can. And so sooner or later, that will probably lead to this kind of catastrophe. So I think all planets with life will face this first and second kind of catastrophe. Now the third kind is what I'm calling inadvertent. And that's sort of what we're going through right now, symbolized on this graph by traffic. And that is what I would call the action of sort of so-called intelligent life, life that's very clever and invents technology, which it greatly enhances its ability to solve local survival problems. But eventually, I think inevitably, will produce global problems. Uh, it, it's, um, it's the, this, this inadvertent category I'm calling the actions of, of um, complex life that develops technology and um, does what life does, again, multiplies and, and increases its activity and um, at least innocently at first, starts to, starts to cause global effects from that activity. And this leads to um, what I've called um, the Anthropocene dilemma, which is that at some point in the development of this kind of life, you have global influence without global control. That's basically what we have now. We are doing uh, not just, I'm not just talking about CO2, but there, there's a whole range of um, technological activities that we are carrying out now where um, there's just no, um, nobody's um, thinking or acting or deciding on, on the course of these activities with any um, thought to the global consequences. So this is, uh, and where you have influence that's far beyond the domain of the control that's being exercised is where you sometimes get into, um, get into trouble with technology. So that's the Anthropocene dilemma. That's the uh, third category of global change. And, I, and just a couple of examples of that. Obviously, on the upper left, this is the famous Keeling curve, the increase of CO2 over time, something we are doing. The, um, the, the consequences of that, the disappearance of the sea ice, and many other consequences. Um, the lower left here is the famous hockey stick sh showing the uh, changes in temperature which um, have a lot of natural variability but are becoming increasingly imprinted by the signal of um, anthropogenic climate change. And then on the lower right here is the, uh, the ozone hole, the famous ozone hole. Another example of inadvertent change where we uh, somewhat um, innocently, again at first, were uh, putting these chemicals in the atmosphere that we thought were inert and perfectly safe. And they are inert and perfectly safe down here in the troposphere where we live. Problem is when they eventually filter up to the stratosphere and get broken up by ultraviolet light, they start doing nasty stuff to the ozone. And um, what's cool though about this example of the ozone hole is that it's, I'm using it as, a, as one example of this third category of global change, the inadvertent, but I also think it's a really good example of this fourth kind of global change that I wanna talk about now, which is um, intentional. Because the ozone 
problem was recognized, by the way, was recognized in no small part because of the activities of comparative planetology. It was people studying the upper atmosphere of the planet Venus, one of my favorite other topics, who said, hey, chlorine's doing interesting things to oxygen on Venus. I wonder if, oh, wait a minute. What about Earth? And it, that, was, that led to, we would have recognized it eventually, but we probably recognized it a few years earlier and got a jump on the problem because we were doing planetary exploration. Anyways, but we recognized this. International agree agreements were made, and the ozone hole, the ozone problem is being fixed. It's not fully fixed because this is a long-term multi-generational problem. It will take 50 years or so to be really on track, but we are on track with it. There's a couple wrinkles in that, a couple things you may have read about, but the overall story is one of recognition of this global agreements and fixing the problem. So it's, a, it's an existence proof that this fourth kind of change can happen. You can argue, and people do, that this is much easier and there with the other problems we have are much harder because of the economic consequences, and that's inarguably true. However, I think as a proof of concept, it's important. So what are some other possible examples of this fourth kind of change, this intentional change? Well, I mentioned, uh, and what do I mean by intentional global change? Well, here's what I would call truly intelligent life. And these are loaded words, but I'm exploring a definition of intelligence where intelligent life hasn't really evolved on a planet if you don't get to this stage. Because what good is intelligence if you can't survive, uh, at least technological intelligence, if you can't actually live with yourself for very long? So uh, I'm exploring a different definition of intelligent life that incorporates this. But at any rate, truly intelligent life, acting with forethought, awareness of its global roles and responsibilities, and the consequences of its action on a global scale. So ozone replenishment is already underway. The halting or reversing of global warming is currently under discussion. Now, some days that discussion may discourage you, and some days it discourages me. However, the fact that it is under discussion, I see as hugely positive. There is a global conversation going on now about this that was not happening a decade or two decades ago. And in the long run, this is the first step and this is very positive and very important. Other kinds of activities that I think also fit in this fourth category, geoengineering is currently under debate. That's much more controversial. Should we try to do something else to fix the problem of global warming rather than the obvious thing, which is just stop doing so much um, burning of fossil fuels? Um, I won't offer an opinion on that now. My, well, um, I, I, I think if we do that at all, we have to proceed with caution. And on the short run, it's not the best solution. In the long run, for, our, for reasons I'll get to, I think it's essential that we learn how to do geoengineering. But if we, if we think that's the whole solution uh, to our problem now, then I think we're in trouble. Uh, but other, ca other items in this category, planetary defense. The dinosaurs didn't have a space program. We do. In theory, that ought to allow us to survive a lot longer. And this goes in that category because it's, hu it's human intervention in what otherwise would be a natural disaster, seeing what's coming and doing something about it. So we are learning what, where the uh, dangerous asteroids are, and we will be developing the ability to prevent them from causing disasters on Earth. That's what I mean by planetary defense. Now, the terraforming of Mars the idea that we could do something to Mars physically to make it more like Earth, uh, that may sound very science fiction to you, and it, you know, thankfully it is, except it is something that scientists are actually considering in, as almost just a playful intellectual exercise, although people do have workshops about this. How would you terraform Mars? What would you do if you decided that it was a good idea to change Mars to be more Earth-like so that Earth life could live there. Now, whether or not it's a good idea is a really interesting, different question. And I think, you know, the, the short answer is if there are Martians, it's a bad idea. If there are definitely no Martians, which we cannot say yet, then there's at least an argument to be made that it's a good idea from, believe it or not, a deep ecology perspective. If you love life and you want there to be more life and you want life to be safe against any kind of planetary disaster and to, to live, then arguably that the terraforming of Mars someday may be a way that we can help to preserve Earth life. Um, anyways, it fits in this category and although I'm not a proponent of trying to terraform Mars, certainly in any 
reasonably short time scale, I do find the intellectual exercise really valuable. The fact that scientists are getting together and saying, well, what would we do? What would, wh how would we do this? Because it's an exercise in thinking about how you would purposefully, intentionally transform a planetary climate, as opposed to the inadvertent, bumbling way we are transforming a climate now. And then in the longer run, we will, assuming we solve our current problems and we're still around in a few thousand years, we will want to prevent future ice ages. Our civilization has been very lucky. We've evolved during a relatively stable time of climate on Earth. Over the long run, Earth is not benign for a civilization like ours. It's a capricious planet. Climate changes. You, you do not want to live through another ice age where all of North America is under a mile of ice and where sea level is dramatically different from the way it is now, where the carrying capacity, the agricultural carrying capacity of the earth plummets so that most people alive starve. It's not a good idea. But fortunately, if we get to that point, we'll know how to do something about it. And that's why we're talking thousands of years at least now, but it fits in this category. And then even much farther, much, much farther in the future, but again in this category of intentional change, eventually if there's anybody here at that time, if we've solved these more short-term problems, we will want to mitigate the inevitable runaway greenhouse due to the evolution of the sun. The sun is very, very slowly heating up. Don't believe anybody who says that the global warming we're observing now has anything to do with that. I'm talking about over billions of years now. But nonetheless, this is a well-known fact by astronomers, and it's inevitable that some one or two billion years hence, the Earth would become uninhabitable to our kind of life because of what's going to happen on the sun, unless somebody decides to do something about it. If we're really around for that long, or if somebody is, or our descendants, or the descendants of our machines, or something else that comes along and evolves, the, the uh, descendants of the elephants after we wipe ourselves out, and they're all sitting there having meetings and wagging their trunks around and pointing their laser pointers, whatever. Anybody who's around then will want to do something about this as a way of preserving not just themselves, but preserving all of Earth life. Okay, so now we've gone out to very long time scales. Now, coming back to the present, how are we to view the present in the long sweep of time? One of the potent aspects of the Anthropocene as a concept is not just that it relates us, it situates us in relation to our past, the deep past, but it also, by placing us in this long landscape, this long temporal landscape of geologic time, it gives us a different way to think about our future. And what will the Anthropocene be? If you imagine somebody a million years from now, a million years hence, digging up these rocks that we're now debating whether to call Anthropocene rocks, the rocks that are being laid down today, this strange strata that has Twinkie wrappers and styrofoam and floppy disks, what will that be in the history of the Earth? There are different kinds of strata in the history of the Earth. There are some that are basically just events like um, I call it here the KT boundary, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, the, the centimeter thick layer of clay that was left by the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. It's a very thin event recording a brief interval. Is that what the Anthropocene will be? Maybe, if it's just all about the burning of the fossil fuels and um, in an orgy of consumption and not thinking about what comes after, then it might just be a layer. But what if it's something longer? What if it's the beginning of something like an epoch, like the Paleocene that lasted for tens of millions of years? Or even, there's a third option, a few times in its long history, the Earth has gone through what can be called transitions, fundamental changes in the way the rules operate such that there's a different, a permanent difference between the before and the after. The origin of life, the Cambrian explosion 600 million years ago when all animal forms that are currently on Earth um, exploded into being. Those are transitions. And is it possible that what we're actually seeing now with this merging of the geological and the historical uh, activities and timescales of Earth is a transition to a new phase in our planet's history? Well, that, of course, depends on what we do. We have a choice here. Uh, and what does it depend on? Well, it depends on how we deal with what some several 
smart people have called the 21st century bottleneck. There, there are several sages on the left here is uh, Sir Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royale of England. On the right is E.O. Wilson, the famous biologist from Harvard. And these are books they, they wrote. And, and uh, Martin Rees in this book, Our Final Hour, gives us a 50-50 chance of surviving the 21st century. Maybe not great odds, but it's a lot better than you know, 10% chance. It gives us a fighting chance if you've got 50-50. It's better odds than my Denver Nuggets have of winning the, uh, the championship this year, but I'm still rooting for them. Okay, anyways, um, so what is this 21st century bottleneck? It's uh, the convergence of all of these different technologies which are accelerating and becoming globally potent. So obviously, the convergence of all these factors, I've listed some of them here, population, energy, global warming, loss of habitat and biodiversity, and then the, all these other scary technologies about nanotechnology and biotechnology, the, the idea of a possibility of an accident that something could, could go wrong. And the convergence of all these have led a lot of these people uh, and, and a lot of futurologists and thinkers to say, well, we're facing a choice that either by the end of the 21st century, we will have essentially become a new kind of civilization that really knows how to globally handle our technology, or we will not be here anymore, that it's approaching a sort of branching point. And that, that may be dismal, but the interesting thing is on the, it, thinking about if, if, if it really is 50-50, that gives us a large chance of making it through. And it's interesting to think about what might be on the other side of that bottleneck. Because technology, as I've alluded to, carries all these threats, but it also carries the potential for wonderful survival and health and feeding people and keeping asteroids from destroying life, and it, 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 in handled the right way, one can conceive of a civilization where technology really becomes a potent tool for um, increasing our ability to survive through all kinds of changes that the universe might throw at us. So this leads me to some thoughts about SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and I won't, I, one could go off on a long tangent about this, which I intend to in my book, but <laughs> here I'll summarize uh, a couple of points. This idea of a bottleneck, if this in fact, as I've argued with my four kinds of change, is actually probably a pattern endemic to the development of technology on planets, then this leads to the possibility of a bifurcation in the lifetime of civilizations. In other words, if you look at, uh, to get nerdy here for a second, if you look at the function, uh, the, the, um, the probability distribution of of lifetime of civilizations, it won't be a smooth function where here's the most likely lifetime and then there's some over here, some over here. It will mean there's a cluster of a lot of short lifetimes and then something on the other end of the bottleneck completely different, the possibility of a really, really long lifetime. This is what I mean by a bifurcation, two very different kinds of outcomes. And what are the implications of that for life in the universe and for us? Well. First of all, it means that a lot of civilizations might just not make it. Um, and this is John, my friend John Lomberg's cartoon of uh, you know, his version of the habitable zone. Planets might be too hot, too cold, and in the middle, here's the one that was too dumb. Well, so, so that's one possible outcome for planets. But there's another outcome, which is sort of tantalizing to think about. Uh, if the Anthropocene is a branching point in planetary history, then what about the ones that make it through? Well, a sustainable technological global civilization may in fact become what I call quasi-immortal. In other words, if natural disasters are no longer threats, if self-imposed disasters are no longer threats because you've somehow developed the wisdom and the global capacity of intentionality, then technology becomes a very, very powerful survival force. And even, and this is where I won't really go into the long tangent, but, but you can actually do the math about this, and I have. You can solve equations where you put in different probability expectations and see what happens in the universe. And the answer is that if the chance of, of achieving such a state is finite, even if it's very tiny, then these quasi-immortal civilizations must exist in increasing and appreciable numbers in the universe because they're like vampires. Once they're created, they can't be destroyed. They stick around. And so even if the chance of creating one is very, very small, if they essentially last for the rest of time in the universe, then they will accumulate. But the other, so that's kind of a neat thought, but the, the, the 
more disturbing aspect of that is that it doesn't ha carry necessarily an optimistic message about our own civilization. It means that the human prospect is not closely linked to the likely abundance of long-lived civilizations. So it may be that these exist out there, but the chance of any civilization at our stage becoming one is very small. Nonetheless, if we, if we discover extraterrestrial intelligence, which some of us are trying very hard to do, it will at least serve to prove that one can make it through this bottleneck and be a hopeful example. But as it is, uh, this is, this last point is what I call cosmic optimism, that there probably is the chance of very wonderful survival out there and that we may or may not get to sort of join that party. Or as Franz Kafka put it once, um, is there hope? Oh yes, there is lots of hope, but not for us. Um, okay, but moving along from that point. Now, the Anthropocene, as I mentioned, whether or not it becomes an official um, part of the geological time scale, it's been very fruitful. Um, there are several interesting debates it has sparked. Should it be an official geological era? I'm not even gonna talk about that one because to me that's the most boring question. It's the, the Ants, the, the term is out there, the concept is out there. M unfortunately, most articles you read about the Anthropocene will focus on this first one, the debate about whether it's gonna be official, but that's not where the action's at. Now, mo slightly more interesting is when did it start? Um, some people, you probably can't read this, but some people think it started with the beginning of agriculture, thousands of years ago when we really started to transform the land of the earth. Some people think it started with the Industrial Revolution, the James Watt steam engine where we started changing the atmosphere and accelerated our change of the landscape. Some people think it started with the, um, the uh, radioisotope markers from the first atomic bomb tests. I've kind of favored that because I think it's very potent you know, the Prometheus tasting the fire and um, seizing the energy from the gods and changing the earth, and it leaves a marker that will be identifiable for a long time in the geologic record. However, recently in thinking about this, I've changed my mind. I don't like any of those. I have a new idea about when the Anthropocene started, and that's that it's, it hasn't really started yet, or it's just starting now. My view is that it really begins with the end of our innocence, with mass awareness of our role as world changers. Because what's really new compared to the cyanobacteria, compared to about anybody, is that not, we're not just changing the world, but we know that we're doing it. We can see that we're doing, and that, doing it, and that gives us a choice. But it's not enough for individuals. Certain individuals, if you read history, have been talking about this for a century. People have been aware of this. But I think it's the mass awareness of our role as world changers and the potential that that mass awareness creates to actually change the program change our behavior, that that's what really creates something new on this planet. So to me, it's self-aware global change that's what is a completely new phenomenon on this planet, and therefore it is just getting started. And that's good news because that means we have a choice as far as what direction it will take. Now, last question in these debates, do we need to fundamentally rethink the nature of nature? The Anthropocene has sparked um, some interesting debates within and beyond the environmental movement as far as what does it mean if we're really somehow in control, somehow uh, dominating the earth, and what do we even mean by nature, and how do we separate the human part of the world from the natural part? What does natural even mean anymore? It sparked some really interesting debates. Now, I have to say that one thing I've encountered a lot of in talking to people about this is what I'm calling Anthropocene shock. People don't like the idea of the Anthropocene. They find it disturbing. And that's good. That means they're paying attention because it is disturbing. I mean, think about it. Isn't it narcissistic and arrogant and self-aggrandizing to say that, I mean, species come and species go. Who are we to say it's so important, that we're so important, that our appearance on Earth is a brand new geological epoch? I mean, that's quite the statement. Furthermore, it carries the obnoxious implication that maybe we're elevating ourselves to godlike status. Do we think we deserve to be in charge? Do we, need to, do, we, do we know how to run a world? No, we don't, but we find ourselves running one. That's the problem. Well, but this does smack uncomfortably of the sort of biblical, biblical world created just for us. Hasn't science throughout its history led us in just the opposite direction of this? Carl Sagan, who was a mentor of mine and who I don't have to tell you who he is, one of the most famous scientists of the last 
uh, century, he, one of the things he talked about frequently at a book chapter um, with his title, The Great Demotions, he talked about how the progress of science has destroyed so many human conceits of thinking that we're so important. The earth is not the center of the universe. We are just an animal embedded in the rest of life. We have not been here for almost the entire history of the earth. Our sun is not even in a special place. Our galaxy is not even in a special place. We're nothing. We're, we have no importance in the story of the universe. He called these the great demotions, and he saw this sort of shattering of our, our conceits as a great achievement of science. He said it is far better to grasp the universe the way it really is than to persist in delusions. Now, with the anthrop Anthropocene, are we sort of reversing that and giving ourselves a great promotion? I mean, aren't we sort of saying, hey, we're important in the story of the Earth now? And isn't that kind of disturbing? And I would say yes and yes. That is what we're doing, and yes, it's very disturbing. Um, but the point of science, as Carl liked to point out, is not to comfort ourselves with feel-good stories. It's to try to find new ways to see things as they really are and then deal honestly with what we learn. And when we add up the evidence, there is no escaping that Earth has entered a new chapter, a new kind of chapter, and therefore the rules have changed and Earth science has to recognize the Anthropocene because the Earth is becoming unrecognizable. Now just um, one, I know I, know I need to um, wrap up um, shortly, and I'm going to, but the, just as an example of the kind of debate this has sparked in the environmental movement, here is an article that was recently published in um, the Earth Island Journal by an environmental philosopher named Kathleen Moore, and she, she doesn't like the notion of the Anthropocene. She said, well, yeah, humans are changing the Earth, but uh, if you read some of these words, she's talking about how we doom ourselves, we destroy the prospects of other beings, um, you know, the, this is moral, moral monstrosity on a planetary scale. And so she says, well, if we got, have to call it something, let's not call it the Anthropocene, let's call it, she says, we're probably in the unforgivable crime scene. Or she says, let's simply call it the obscene epic. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think this is representative of a certain um, strain of thought. Now, the problem I have with that is that I think we have to be careful. I, I, and I've been a lifelong environmentalist, and I very much consider myself environmental, an environmentalist. But I think we have to be careful of sort of uh, misanthropy, of being anti-human. I think you can love the earth without hating humanity. And sometimes when, you, when I hear some of these people talk about, oh, we're so horrible, we're so horrible, it almost seems like they want to be exempted. Like if they say, well, I acknowledge it enough, then they somehow absolve themselves of responsibility. It doesn't work that way. We're in this, we're in the world now, in the situation we're in, and we have to find a path to the future. If you look at the metaphors that we often use to describe ourselves, they're so negative. We're a cancer on the earth. We're a virus on the earth. We're criminals. We're murdering the biosphere. We're raping the forest. I mean, all this has a certain truth to it. Our growth patterns are very cancer-like in their exponential runaway uh, behavior. And yet, I think we have to be careful with these metaphors. I think we have to have some positive visions of the future in order to change the way we think in the ways we need to in order to survive and, and do the Anthropocene in the right way. I think that this negativity has the potential to verge into nihilism and apathy that can be very dangerous. So what about some new metaphors? Well, what are we doing on this planet? We suddenly find ourselves here. We are, you know, at the wheel of this, this truck going furiously down this track. Nobody's ever taught us how to drive. That's one metaphor. We're like babies. We're like orphans. Here we are. Nobody, there aren't any adults to show us how to run this planet, but clearly we better grow up and learn how to do it because we need to survive. There's a, there's a series of science fiction stories that I really love, um, that, um, and Orphans of the Sky here is one of them. They're called generation ship stories. And a generation ship story, it's kind of a classic science fiction story, where the idea is that because it takes a long time to travel to other stars, and this is true, longer than a human lifetime probably, that you set off on a really large self-contained ship such that many generations of humans can live on that ship, and the people that eventually arrive there are the descendants, several generations removed from those who set off from Earth. And um, it carries all kinds of interesting moral questions. You know, who are you to decide, make decisions which the future generations are going to have to live with and it's going to determine their lives. Um, and in these stories, something always goes wrong. There's been a revolution, there's been uh, a malfunction, and 
people have reverted to some kind of primitive state, some kind of non-technological state where they don't know that they're on a ship. It's just the world they're on and it's running by autopilot and uh, running along. And then, and, then, and then some people, our heroes, our protagonists, discover that they're on a ship. They find a porthole and they see the stars and they go, whoa, we're moving through some much larger space. Or they find a control room or a manual that they can't read or something. They realize that they're on a ship. They realize that everything they thought about their wor the nature of their world was wrong. And they realize that they have to wake everybody up and get them to see the truth about their reality or they're all going to die. And they're embedded in this chain of decisions where they're fully dependent on the decisions their ancestors made, and depending on how they solve their current problem, their descendants will have a future or won't have a future. Now, in a certain sense, I think that's a good metaphor for where we're at. Now, with the scientific revolution, we've seen the stars. We've realized, oh, this is the nature of our world. And now we're realizing, oh, th we're actually kind of running this place, but we don't know how to run a world, and we don't have a manual. Hey, everybody, wake up. We have to figure out how to do this. Uh, and, 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 and it doesn't matter. We can say our ancestors were horrible. They did these horrible things. They got us into this mess. But that doesn't really help us with our current situation. We have to take stock of where we are and figure out how to proceed and have a vision of where we're going in the future. So this is why I, I like the phrase Terra sapiens. We, we have to, well, this is what I v see as our task. We have to create a wise earth. In order for our civilization to survive, we have to become a new kind of entity on this planet and learn to live comfortably over the long haul with world-changing technology. How do we do that? Well, this is, a, you may be familiar with R. Crumb, the uh, underground uh, cartoonist. And this was his, a, a series of cartoons he did which was called um, the, A Brief History of America. Um, he did this in the 70s. And see up on the upper left is this bucolic scene and then slowly you get a few little buildings and everything's all nice and then you know it accelerates and then by the lower right you're like ah we're in the Anthropocene what do we do um, well several years after this was published the editors of Whole Earth Review asked R. Crumb if he would do a follow-up showing um, the outcome of the future and so he did he, he did another cartoon which showed three possible futures and here they are. The top one he calls worst case scenario, ecological disaster. And you can see what that looks like. And we don't want to live in that world. And then the other two, the middle one is what he called the fun future. Techno, what does it say? Oh, technology on the march. So it's like everything's going to be solved by great technology and we'll be flying around in our saucers and having a great time. And then the bottom one is the ecotopian solution where everybody's riding around on bicycles and living in tree houses and we've just figured out how to live lightly on the land. Well, we don't want number one. So I submit that we're going to have to find some combination of two and three where we learn to be more cognizant of our footprint and we also smartly use technology to help us solve some of these problems. Um, one of the, um, I'm really slightly over time here, aren't I? All right, well, I've just got two more slides, I believe. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the wonderful things about working here in the Kluge Center, in the library, in Washington, has been the incredible community of scholars that I've had to interact with. Not just here in the library, I have to say, I've met people from the, the Smithsonian and Georgetown and G George Washington and other um, local institutions who um, are interested from different perspectives in the same thing I'm interested in. And here in the library, with the, the number of scholars coming through, I've had some surprising conversations and, and unexpectedly fruitful interactions. And one of them, um, I, well, I include a picture here of a panel discussion we did earlier in my tenure here with myself and a, um, a historian, an environmental historian named Jean-Francois Mouhot, and um, a, a literary scholar named Matthias uh, Klestil. And these guys were both interested in some of the same things I'm interested in, even though they're not scientists. We found we were all really interested in new ideas about the environment. And in particular, Jean-Francois said some things that were really thought-provoking to me. He, um, he's interested in environmental history, and he was talking about Thomas Jefferson and about slavery. And he made a really interesting comparison between um, the ethics of slavery in Jefferson's day and the ethics of climate change in our day. In other words, he said, 
if you read Jefferson's writing, I mean, Jefferson's a paradox to a lot of us because, you know, here we are in the Jefferson Building and the Jefferson Monument, and he's, you know, all these wonderful words about freedom and human dignity and respect. And, um, and yet, of course, he famously um, kept slaves. And um, how, did he, how did he reconcile this? Well, Jean-Francois talked about a sort of moral deficit that people like Jefferson in his day lived with, that they wanted energy, they wanted power. In his case, it was human power. And somehow that was so valuable and they could not see a way to preserve their sort of core way of life without that, that they lived with this moral deficit of doing something that they knew was evil. And he was drawing a parallel to that with um, our current need to power our civilization. And we, we can't imagine giving up the things that we have. And so we live with some of these behaviors that we know are harmful and destructive. So I thought that was, was really interesting um, and in a, in a sort of perverse way, hopeful, because uh, it showed me, it reminded me that mores and societal values that seem um, rigid and fixed and unchangeable do change over the generations, that, uh, that humanity does evolve. Slavery is not an acceptable part of our culture anymore. You can point out that it still exists in the world, but you cannot deny that, that uh, there's been a massive shift in that. And so this, to me, uh, is one example. If you draw the, if you draw the uh, example with, um, with uh, Jean-Francois' example with fossil fuels, then that implies that, yes, we can evolve here. And you know, walking around the library, as you may have noticed, is, is um, working here has been both distracting and inspiring because everywhere you walk, if you want to be distracted from what you're doing, there's some really interesting quotation on the wall and you can stop and think about it. And this bottom one is from the, uh, you see when you walk into the um, science reading room, the main science reading room over in the Adams building. And it's from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to Madison, and it reads, the earth belongs always to the living generation. They may manage it then and what proceeds from it as they please during their usufruct. They are masters too of their own persons and consequently may govern them as they please. So in Jefferson's time, he was saying, hey, the earth belongs to this generation that's here now. And he equated that with personal liberty, which he saw as this lofty goal. And it sort of made sense at that time. The earth was infinite. The West was infinite. There was all this room for expansion. We weren't doing anything that are bad to our descendants by doing what we would on the earth. And, but now that reality has changed. We've learned something new about the limits of the earth and that, that moral that moral value has to change. And so this is just by way of, of saying, you know, some, of, some being here has allowed me to be in contact with some of these ideas and to really think about what it might take for us to sort of get through this. Uh, I, I've really had a good time here reading some books that, that were about the future written in the past. One of the, my little side projects has been a brief history of the future. And um, for instance, this is a book written by J.D. Bernal when he was a young man in 1929. This book happened to be called The Most Brilliant Attempt at Scientific Prediction Ever Made by Arthur C. Clarke, who ought to know. Um, and, and that very ending of the book, I would like to quote to you here. He says, Bernal said in 1929, we hold the future still timidly, but perceive it for the first time as a function of our own action. Having seen it, are we to turn away from something that offends the very nature of our earliest desires? Or is the recognition of our new powers sufficient to change those desires into the service of the future which they will have to bring about? Is our realization that we are changing the world enough to actually change ourselves in such a way that will allow us to change it in a way that we want to? I think that's what Bernal, even in 1929, was asking. And so, in conclusion, this really is my last slide. Um, I'm hopeful because I think it's so hard to read the future. There's so much uncertainty, and where there's uncertainty, there's room for hope. Exponential technological innovation is transforming our world in surprising and accelerating ways. We're connected to people elsewhere in a way that we never have been. And that's at the beginning and nobody knows how that's going to play out. Possibilities that until recently seemed magical are now imminent, rendering the future frightening, exhilarating, and above all, unpredictable. 
Where there's uncertainty, there is also hope and choice and room for faith in ourselves. And personally, I believe that we are just getting started on this planet. So from this cosmic vantage point on our own evolutionary history and our current global situation, we have the option to choose the future we want. And with self-awareness, bravery, and humility, to reach for the wheel of history and steer a path toward infinite potential. Then the real enlightenment can begin and we can start behaving as human beings, care for our world, and begin to contemplate our galactic destiny. Thank you. So I've run a little bit over, but um, we do have time for a couple questions. Jason has the microphone, which he will hand to the questioner. We've got a question right here in the front row. Going to make Jason run around a lot. I'll, I'll try to be brief, but I, I was uh, reminded of uh, Stanley Kubrick's and Arthur C. Clarke's uh, 2001, in which the ape threw the bone up and came to the spaceship. And, uh, that, that next evolutionary leap, and it seems to me that, you know, one definition of man is homo faber, the tool-making animal. If, if, if we get around to calling ourselves the Anthropocene epoch, it might be anachronistic. It might be, well, better call the Mechanocene or Technocene epoch. And Terra Dultus, if we keep building machines that are exponentially, increasingly brighter and smarter than ourselves, I mean, what reason would they have to keep us around other than pets? That's a good, it's a good question. One possible future is that we are, some people have recently been saying that uh, intelligent machines will be the last invention we ever make. Um, and, and it could be. Uh, personally, I'm skeptical of that. But I think the answer is nobody knows if we could really create a self-aware, intelligent machine. Obviously, we can create machines with fast processors and better memories, and we currently are becoming a new kind of entity in our partnership with those machines in a way that um, is actually facilitating a lot of, you know, some of the problems, but also potentially a lot of the solutions. Will those machines ever become conscious and start making decisions on their own and then possibly leave us in the, in the silicon dust? Um, I don't know, and there are people that have strong opinions about this, and they're, they're all uninformed because nobody knows. They, it rests on an assumption about how the human brain works and what consciousness is that we don't know the answer to. So that is one possible future. If the machines do become conscious and aware, it's by no means obvious that they would just decide to leave us in the dust. Maybe they'll be compassionate and we'll form some kind of interesting partnership. And, you know, there's so many possible branching points in this discussion one could go down. But I, I think that some people take it as a given that that's about to happen. And there's famously people who almost have a religion based on that. And I think that they're, um, they, they, that nobody really knows. Sir. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> oh, here we go. Here you go. Uh, the slide that showed some of the books uh, that you're interested in, that are interesting to you and others, uh, did not include uh, The Human Phenomenon by Teilhard de Chardin. Would yeah. you comment about the harmonization of uh, the Earth and the possibility that what's happening here is not so much our influence on the Earth as the Earth's influence on us? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Teilhard de Chardin and, and uh, The Phenomenon of Man, his book, because in fact, that was in one of my slides, which I was furiously deleting so I could be almost within the hour, and obviously I didn't furiously delete enough of the slides, but, but as you might expect, and, and you can tell, I can tell from, from, from your question, he, he is an important influence, an important, um, if you trace the history of thought of how, um, life and then conscious life are becoming factors in the evolution of the planet, then you have to mention um, the, the nuosphere, which was the concept of Thierry de Chardin and Vladimir Vernadsky. So some people, in the, even in the 19-teens and 1920s, were aware of what was coming, and they called this the nuosphere, which the sphere of human intellect, or the sphere of intellect changing the planet, which is really the same thing as the Anthropocene, which some people have now discovered the Anthropocene. It's really the same as the nuosphere, only for them it was this speculative thing, oh, wouldn't that be interesting way off in the future? Now it's 
sort of a, from a slightly more panicked, like, wow, this is happening, we better deal with it. But it's the same concept. And yes, absolutely, it's a, it's a, um, it's a dialectic. Humans are changing the Earth, Earth change, is changing the humans, as has been the case with life. And that's you know, the Gaia hypothesis, that Earth and the life have been engaged in this sort of historical dance with one another. It's not like one is just sitting there and the other is evolving. I think the same is true now with intellect, that we have, in fact, become a part of the systems of Earth. And they are obviously pushing back on us in interesting ways. And as we evolve in the future, it's a matter of sort of recognizing our role in that and not assuming that we can just find the levers and control the earth. It's more how are we going to dance with the earth? How are we going to how are we going to garden? But when you garden, you have to let the plants do do what they do. You don't just control everything, right? Um, one in the back here. What are your thoughts about the uh, uh, relationship between humans and animals and all, and all these problems? I mean, are they of no consequence or are, or are they actually necessary f for our uh, survival? Well, gosh, that's a great question. There's so many dimensions one could um, answer that. Um, the relations between humans and animals. I mean, for one thing, there are the, um, the intelligent animals. And I didn't mean to imply with anything I said that humans are the only intelligent creatures on Earth. I think we have a lot to learn, for instance, from um, the intelligent cetaceans and how they've evolved these complex social societies. And I think that we have to um, you know, not assume that we're the only intelligence and that we can't learn and cannot uh, increasingly develop an understanding of our moral responsibilities towards those other intelligent creatures we share this planet with. Now, as far as the, the total of life on Earth, absolutely. I mean, we need the other species for all kinds of reasons. As I mentioned in response to this other gentleman's questions, we're embedded in these systems. We don't know how to run everything without, we're, we're very much dependent. So while we may be sort of, um, you know, steering the, the, stale, the, the sailboat and moving the tiller, you know, we still have to read, the, read the, the currents and the winds. And a lot of that has to do with our interactions with the other species. So we are both dependent upon them and we have to be very careful with our, um, what we do with the, to the biodiversity of this planet. And of course, we have great moral responsibility towards them. Um, I can, Give, try to give a longer answer, but that's, you know, that's a short answer is that yes, very, very important part of the equation. I'm afraid we have to bring this to a close because we are way over time, but you can continue the conversation informally and join us for reception in the back. Let us thank our speaker again. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.